Good afternoon and welcome to today's daily coronavirus briefing. I'm news reporter Dwayne Hart with MK Local News and Dwayne is UK3. I would like to begin by updating you on the current pandemic cases confirmed, deaths and recovered international. There are coronavirus outbreak maps, confirmed cases 5,347,684 confirmed cases. Today, the confirmed cases there is plus 8,088. Deaths, 344,133. Today, plus 170. Recovered, 2,169,005. Today, plus 10,974. In the United Kingdom, there are 259,559 confirmed cases. Deaths, 36,793. Recovered, not stated. Spain, 235,209, no, 290, 28,678, slash 150,376. United States, 1 million confirmed cases and 636,222. Deaths, 97,276. Recovered, 366,736. Canada, 84,688, slash deaths, 6,424, slash recovered, 43,998. Coronavirus, how scared should, be, should we be? Coronavirus has been described as an invisible killer. What could be more terrifying than that? A couple of things. A deadly pathogen we cannot spot, and then when it hits, we cannot treat. It is unsurprising, therefore, that many people are fearful of going out, returning to normal, or even letting children go back to school. People want to be safe, but the problem is, we are no longer as safe as we once were. Correct. Especially with Dominic Cummings. There is, after all, a new virus around that can have catastrophic consequences. The need to balance competing risks. So what should we do? Some have argued restrictions need to continue until safety can be guaranteed, including me. But those arguments generally ignore the fact that continuing to do so carries risk in itself. Correct. UK Chief Medical Officer Professor Christopher Whitty often describes these as the indirect costs of the pandemic. They include everything from poor access to healthcare for other conditions, through to rises in mental illness, financial hardship and damage to education. So as restrictions ease, society and individuals themselves are going to have to make decisions based on balancing competing sets of risks. Why you should not expect to be 100% safe. Professor Devi Sridhar, Chair of the Global Public Health at Edinburgh University, says the question we should be asking is whether we are safe enough. There will never be no risk in a world where COVID-19 remains present in the community it's about how we reduce that risk. Just as we do with other kinds of daily dangers, like driving and cycling. But that not as dangerous. She was referring to the row over schools, but the concept can be equally applied to many other scenarios. She says part of that equation depends on the steps taken by government on things such as social distancing, the provision of protective equipment, and the availability of testing and then tracing of contacts to contain local outbreaks. She has been critical of the way the government has handled all of them. How much risks do individuals face? But as more freedoms are returned, the role of individual decision making will soon come into force. Will come more into force. It is perhaps not about finding the right option, rather finding the least word option, worst option. Statistician Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter, an expert in risk from Cambridge University and government advisor, says it, ha it has, in effect, became a game of risk management. And because of that, we need to handle on the magnitude of the risk we face every day in our daily lives. There are two factors that influence the risk we face from coronavirus. Our risk of becoming infected and once infected our risk of dying or becoming seriously or chronically ill. If we are not in a hospital or a care home, our best guide to the risk of infection comes from government surveillance programme, 
run by the Office for National Statistics. The data published this week suggests that around 1 in 400 people is currently infected. The chances of coming into close contact with one of those individuals, certainly as we are practising social distancing, even when out and about, it is considered to be very slim, although clearly some people, depending on their jobs, are at higher risk than others, i.e. key workers. The hope is that the level of infection will reduce even further in time if the government test track and track trace programme keeps the virus suppressed. The hope is that the level of infection will reduce even further. Then if we do become infected, the fact remains that for most people, coronavirus is a mild or moderate illness. Only one in 20 people who show symptoms is believed to need hospital treatment. How to quantify your risk? Those with pre-existing health conditions are most at risk. Deaths among under 65s with no illnesses are remarkably uncommon, research shows. Perhaps the easiest way to ask is yourself to what extent you are worried about the thought of dying in the next 12 months. What is remarkable about coronavirus is that if we are infected, our chances of dying seems to mirror our chances of dying anyway over the next year, certainly once we pass the age of 20. For example, an average I, an average person aged 40 has around a 1 in 1,000 risk of not making it to their next birthday and an almost identical risk of not survi surviving a coronavirus infection. That means your risk of dying is effectively doubled from what it was if you are infected. And that is the average risk for most individuals. The risk is actually lower than that uh, as most of the risk is held by those who are in poor health in each age group. So coronavirus is in effect taking any frailties and amplifying them. It is like packing an extra year's worth into risk into a short period of time. If your risk of dying was very low in the first place, it still remains very low. As for children, the risk of dying from other things, cancer and accidents are the biggest cause of fatalities, is greater than their chance of dying if they are infected with coronavirus. During the pandemic so far, Three under 15s have died. That compares to around 50 killed in road accidents every year. <sighs> Identifying those at risk. So what seems crucial as we all try to balance risks is identifying those at significant risk of serious illness from coronavirus. Whether we all fall into one of those groups ourselves or have close contact with someone who dies was, or does have COVID-19. Currently, the government is asking 2.5 million people to completely isolate themselves. This includes people who have had organ transplants, are having cancer treatment and those with severe respiratory disease. On top of those, there are more than 10 million people who fall into higher risk groups. This includes all of the over 70s, people with health conditions ranging from diabetes to heart conditions. Professor Sarah Harper, an expert in ageing at the University of Oxford, has argued the blanket and arbitrary use of age needs looking at the actual level of risk within the higher risk group varies enormously. The tool developed by University College London has attempted to tease out some of the differences in the risk. Finding out more about these is not going to be crucial as we move forward. Coronavirus, which regions have been worse hit? The rate of excess deaths in London continues to fall at a faster pace than in the rest of England and Wales as all parts of the country move past the peak of a coronavirus pandemic. London recorded 333 excess deaths in the week, ending at the 8th of May 2020. Three quarters of them mentioned COVID-19 on the death certificate, according to the data for Office for National Statist Statistics, ONS. Excess deaths refer to the number of deaths from all causes registered in any week, which are above the five-year average for that week of the year. The week ending 17th of April was the worst hit in the capital with over 2,300 excess deaths. But by the week ending 8th of May, both the South East, the North East and the West Midlands registered a larger number of excess deaths than London for that week. COVID-19 deaths. The same pattern can be seen with deaths specifically linked to COVID-19. The week ending the 8th of May is the second week since coronavirus arrived in Britain. 
which London did not register the highest number of COVID-19 deaths. The North West had the highest weekly count with 597 death certificates mentioning a confirmed or suspected case of the disease. Every region of England and Wales has passed the peak of the pandemic. London, the West Midlands, the North West and Wales recorded their peak in the week ending 17th of April. That rhymes. The South East the, and the South West, East Midlands and Yorkshire and the Humber regions all recorded their worst week of deaths in the week to 24th of April. Regions with, regions with a later peak have tended to see a more gradual decline in the number of excess deaths. Worse than the blips, London recorded 21% of the total number of COVID-19 deaths in England and Wales until the 1st of May, despite having only 15% of the population. In the four weeks to the 24th of April, more people were killed by coronavirus in London than died during the worst four-week period of aerial bombing of the city during the blitz in the World War II. Registered deaths in London attributed to COVID-19 in those four weeks reached 5,901, according to the ONS, whereas figures held in the National Archives and collated by Commonwealth War Graves Commission show that 4,607 67, 677 people were killed during the Blitz and buried in London cemeteries in the 28 days to the 4th of October 1940. These are the best figures available for the civilian deaths in the Blitz. And Richard Overy, Professor of History at the University of Exeter, this dramatic war on civilians has come to symbolise the horrors of total war with the images of burning and ruined buildings and bodies dug out from the rubble. All the more poignant is the contrast with the current epidemic which killed considerably more people in 28 days in London's hospitals and care homes. Most deprived areas, separate ONS data released on the 1st of May, shows that once you take the age of population into account, the rate of deaths involving COVID-19 is roughly twice as high in the most deprived areas of England and Wales as in the least deprived. We all know that people in more deprived areas are less likely to have jobs where they can work from home, said Helen Barnard from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. This means they may have to face a very significant drop in income or keep going to work, facing the greater risk of catching the virus. They are also more likely to live, they are also more likely to live in overcrowded homes, increasing the risk for whole families. The data shows that the highest rates of deaths involving COVID-19 are in inner city areas where lots of people live close together. The majority of the highest aged standardised mortality rates are in London boroughs such as Newham, Brent and Hackney. Other factors, one of the biggest issues for policy makers over the coming weeks will be to try to establish what other factors may be causing the current say, surge in excess deaths. Further deaths from COVID-19 will continue to happen despite the lockdown measures. But it will also be vital to establish how many deaths may be happening because of the restrictions if people are not getting the treatment or support they need or other health conditions. Other nations' figures. National Records Scotland releases figures on a slightly different time scale. In the week to the 17th of May, there were 1,415 deaths registered in Scotland. That's 33% higher than the five-year average for this week of 1,064. Around a fifth of the death certificates mentioned COVID-19. The Glasgow area has been the far, the far the worst hit by the virus. In Northern Ireland, for the week ending the 8th of May, there were 336 deaths registered, up from the five-year average of 274. COVID-19 was mentioned on death certificates Falls again. Coronavirus, what tests are being done in the UK? Everyone aged five and over in the UK with coronavirus symptoms can now be tested for the disease, our Secretary Matt Hancock has announced. So what exactly is the government testing strategy? Can I get tested for coronavirus? Making tests available to anyone over five with symptoms is a major expansion of the UK's testing programme. 
when testing started, it was only for the sickest patients in hospitals, but eligibility, eligibility gradually grew. If you think you need a coronavirus test, you can arrange to visit a regional test site. Alternatively, you can ask for a home test kit, although these have to be in short supply. The test is performed by taking a swab up the nose or from the back of the throat. At the first from the British Medical Association, said assessing centres was a major problem, with some people having to drive hundreds of miles to their nearest site. New testing centres have since been opened, although people must still have access to a car and someone to drive them, all be well enough to drive themselves. The army was also enlisted to provide pop-up testing facilities in sparsely populated areas further away from any of the main sites. However, concerns have been raised about the long waits for some test results. Mr Hancock also announced that the government was trialling a new, much quicker swab test with, with, which did, doesn't need to be sent to a lab and given results in 20 minutes. The new swab test will be trialled in Hampshire in some A&E departments. GP testing hubs and care homes, the trial will run for six weeks and test up to 4,000 people. If successful, he said the new test will be rolled out on a larger scale as soon as we can. What was the 100,000 target? The government set out a target of 100,000 coronavirus daily tests per day across the UK by the end of April and managed to log 122,347 tests on the 30th of April but it was criticised for including in this figure about 40,000 testing kits which are counted when they are sent out. The target was also met on the 1st of May. It was missed for eight consecutive days after that before being met again on the 10th of May. On the 20th of May, 128,340 tests were provided. Now the government is working towards a fresh target to get to 200,000 tests a day by the end of May. But this figure seems to refer to testing capacity, not the actual number of tests carried out. What is antibody testing? The swab test only tells you if you currently have COVID-19. However, health officials in England have approved a test that will show if someone has coronavirus symptoms or has had coronavirus symptoms in the past. The new test from Swiss pharmaceutical firm Botch looks for antibodies in the blood to see if a person has had the virus and might now have some form of immunity. On the 21st of May, Mr Hancock said 10 million tests have been ordered through what watching and pharmaceutical company Abbott. He said it would be available to health and social care staff, patients and care home residents from next week. There is an antibody test already in use at government research facility Porton Down to make early estimates about what percentage of population may have had the virus, but it's not accurate enough to give individuals information about their infection status. There are also questions about how long immunity lasts. There is no evidence for people with or who have had recovered from COVID-19 and have antibodies are protected from being infected again. The World Health Organization, WHO, says, why is testing important? People are tested to diagnose them individually but it can also be used to understand how far the virus has spread in the population. Tests, ha tests help people, including NHS workers, know whether they are safe to go to work. Why testing can also let the health service plan for extra demand and inform government decisions around your social distancing and lockdowns. For this reason, an, an initial 20,000 households in England will be tested every month for a year for active coronavirus infections and for antibodies indicating a past infection. How the UK has been too slow in testing for COVID-19. The UK significantly increased its testing capacity throughout April, but lagged behind many other nations. Germany, for example, was regularly averaging 100,000 tests a day by the start of last month. The UK did not start with the resources to do mass testing unlike some other countries. But it also took several weeks to expand from an initial eight public health laboratories to a wider network of private and university labs. Hong Kong security law needed to tackle terrorism. 
Americans drop two beaches on Memorial, Memorial Day weekend. Revelers party at Osage Beach of the Lake of Ozarks. Mystery photo, 23rd of May 2020. People are seen collapsing restrictions on what is known in the US as the unofficial start of summer. Coronavirus inside a reopened primary school in the time of COVID-19. Primary children in Denmark have been back at school for a month now. It was the first country in Europe to open it, Europe to open its primary schools after containing the virus early on. There have been fewer than 550 deaths so far. Dominic Cummins, what did he do during lockdown? <coughs> UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has given his full backing to his most senior advisor Dominic Cummins after he was accused of breaking lockdown rules. Mr Johnson and Mr Cummins acted responsibly, legally and with integrity and that he acted with the overwhelming aim of stopping the spread of the virus. What are the claims? We know the Prime Minister's chief aide drove 260 miles no, that's not against government guidelines or law, surely from his London <laughs> sarcasm, from his London home to his parents' estate in County Durham as the height of restrictions in March. The allegations in the Observer and Sunday Mirror said the former vote leave boss did not stay indoors while in Durham and also that he made another trip there after returning to London in April. What are the key dates? Mr Cumming was seen on Downing Street on the 14th of April. 23rd of March, the Prime Minister tells the UK public they must stay at home. People are warned not to meet friends or family members they do not live with. Those with, sim those with symptoms had already been told to self-isolate. On the 27th of March 2020, Boris Johnson and Health Secretary Matt Hancock test positive for coronavirus, while Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty says he has symptoms of the disease and is self-isolating a while ago. Mr Cummings is seen leaving. Number 10 Downing Street, Transport Secretary Grant Sharps later tells the BBC's Andrew Marr that his understanding was his the chief aide travelled to Durham on the 27th or 28th of March. 30th of March, no 10 said Cummings is self-isolating at home with coronavirus symptoms. 31st of March, police in Durham are made aware, Durham are made aware of reports that an individual had travelled from London to Durham and was present at Durham, was present at an address in the city. The full sounds that the following morning an officer spoke with Mr Cummings' father at his own request and he confirmed his son had travelled with his family to the North East and was self-isolating in part of the property. It says the full steam found no further action was required. However, the officer did provide advice in relation to security issues. On the 5th of April, an unnamed neighbour tells the Daily Mirror and the Guardian that Mr Cummings was seen in his parents' garden. I got the shock of my life as I looked over to the gates and saw him. They say the Guardian later approached his 10 Downing Street about this and is told it will be a no comment on that one. Convenient. 12th of April, Mr Cummings visits Barnard Castle, 30 miles from his parents' home in Durham, Durham according to the Observer and Mirror on Sunday, the Prime Minister did not deny this, when given the opportunity to do so, but said some of the press reports about Mr Cummings' movements were palpably false. Retired teacher Robin Lees, who says he saw someone who looked like Mr Cummings at Barnard the Castle and jotted down his number plate, files a complaint to the police about the number 10 aid breaking lockdown. 14th of April, Mr Cummings is photographed at 10 Downing Street for the first time since 27th of March and that public 10 Downing Street or just 10 Downing, or Downing Street. 19th of April, five days after being in London, Mr Cummings is seen again in Durham, Durham by an unnamed witness. The Observer and Mirror reports on Sunday. Downing Street says this is false. What had Mr Cummings said? Dominic Cummings told the reporters he was doing the right thing, not what them guys think. Speaking to the reporters outside his home in London on Saturday morning, he said he has done the right thing by travelling with his wife and young son 
to be near relatives when she developed COVID-19 symptoms at the end of March. When asked whether her trip, his trip to Durham looks good, he said, who cares about good looks? Idiot. It's a question of doing the right thing. It's not about what you guys think, which is the right thing. Stupid man. Asked later on Saturday whether he could reconsider his position, he said, obviously not. He added, you guys are probably all about as right about, as you were about Brexit. Do you remember how right you were all about that? No. What had Boris Johnson said? Boris Johnson depend, defends his senior advisor, Dominic Cummins. Mr Johnson told the Daily Darren Street briefing on Sunday that he had held extensive face-to-face -face talks with Mr Cummins to discuss the situation. I've concluded that in the travelling to find the right kind of childcare at the moment, when he and his wife were about to be incapacitated by coronavirus, and when he had no alternative, which he did, I think he followed the instinct of every father and every parent. Wow, idiot. And I do not mark him down for that, the Prime Minister said. He added, I believe that in every respect, he acted legally respon and responsibly and legally and with integrity and with the overwhelming aim of stopping the spread of the virus and saving lives. How, how has Number 10 responded? Downing Street issued an initial statement about the Dur Durham trip says Mr Cummins, made the journey fearing both he and his wife will be unable to properly care for their four-year-old for their four-year-old son. His sister and nieces had volunteered to help, so he went to a house near to but separate from his extended family in case their help was needed. His sister shopped for the family and left everything outside the statement, says. Sat down in the street, said no member of Mr Cummins' family was spoken to by police, although Durham Constabulary later said officers had spoken to his father by phone. A further number 10 statement addressing allegations in the Sunday papers about a second visit to North East was issued on Saturday night. Yesterday, the Mirror and Guardian wrote inaccurate stories about Mr Cummins, it said. Today, they are, they are writing more inaccurate stories about claims that Mr Cummins returned to Durham after returning to work in De 10 Downing Street on the 14th of April. We will not waste our time answering a stream of false allegations about Mr Cummins from campaigning newspapers. What are others saying? Daily Mirror political editor Pippa Carrera told the BBC on Sunday the paper stood by its reporting. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer called for a cabinet office inquiry saying Mr Johnson had failed a huge test I'm not sacking Mr Cummins. I'm not sacking Mr Cummins. Treating the British public with contempt. He also said he would have sacked the chief advisor if they had been prime minister. Both the SNP and the Liberal Democrats have said Mr Cummins should go and have also written to the cabinet secretary, Sir Mark said we'll call him for an investigation. Scotland's first minister and leader for the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon, said she believed Mr Cummins should step down in a similar way to Scottish Chief Medical Officer Catherine Calderwood, who resigned after visiting her second home. She said Mr Johnson was putting his po political interest ahead of the public interest and the consequences of the public health message would be very serious. A number of buy shops took to Twitter about Mr Johnson's Sunday press conference calling for Mr Cummings to go and some measures and some members of the government scientific advisory group Group for Emergencies, SAGE, SAGE, who are advising the government on how to tackle the coronavirus pandemic, have also criticised the response to the senior advisors' actions. A number of Conservatives also said Mr Cummins should step down. Simon Hall, who sits on the Liaison Select Committee, which is due to the question the Prime Minister later told the BBC News, he respectively disagreed with Mr Johnson's decision and said there had been a slight cavalier attitude despite the fury of the pandemic. The majority of the party's MPs have not been commented. Many members of the cab cabinet, including House Secretary Matt Hancock, Chancellor of the Ex Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, tweeted their support for Mr Cummings on Saturday, but have not tweeted since. Education Secretary Ga Gavin Williams said on Monday morning, 
that Cummins has set out absolutely clearly and absolutely categorically. He didn't break the rules and didn't break the law. He said because of the assurance given to the Prime Minister that neither the guidance nor the law had been broken, it seems to be fair to support that person. It's disgusting. Education Secretary Gavin Williams told school reveals exact date schools in England will reopen supposedly. Yeah. The Education Secretary has revealed the exact date that the government is aiming to reopen schools in England. During an interview with Sky News this morning, Gavin Williamson clarified the date that schools in England are expected to begin reopening as the coronavirus lockdown is lifted. Mr Williamson said the government is aiming to have schools open on June the 1st, 2020, throughout that week. The Conservative, M Conservative MP said from June the 1st, we are going to be inviting and wanting all schools to start opening. But wanting isn't the law, that's the problem. We have set out guidance explaining to them, guidance, not law, explaining to them how we want them to do this. We have always been clear that from the June the 1st, 2020, schools should start re returning in a careful, cautious face. <laughs> we have been working very closely with local authorities as well as Academy Trust to make sure this is done in the best possible way. We are very confident, are you, that a large number of schools are going to be opening all the way through that week. Last week, the BBC's Laura Kunzberg revealed there is frustration inside the UK government regarding the confusion surrounding schools reopening as UK lockdown eases. The BBC's political editor described the reopening of schools as fiendishly complicated due to 150 local schools and councils and hundreds of schools in being involved in the process. Ms Kunzberg added that teachers and parents also ha have their own concerns regarding the reopening of schools for children of certain age groups. Ms, Ms. Kunzberg said inside the government there is a bit of frustration that they have tried to answer lots of the questions people have. For example, many people might wonder how do you keep a bunch of wriggling five-year-olds at least two metres apart from each other? <laughs> exactly. The government has actually said, according to the guidance, as long as children are keeping in small groups, no bigger than 15, right, they actually can be closer to each other than the rest of us are advised to do. No, they can't. The truth of it is this is simply for fiend fiendishly accomplished. You have 150 councils, hundreds of schools, the central government only looking at schools in England. Then you have got teachers, parents and everybody with their own concerns. Exactly that. Listen, Boris, at the time of writing, Britain has the fifth highest number of COVID-19 cases in the world. The UK has more than 259,000 cases in the total time of that writing. The death toll in Britain is currently over 36,000. Dominic Cummins' pension to sack Mr Cummins reaches 226,000. Will he quit? Dominic Cummins is under increasing pressure to resign his post at Tories MP by shops NHS staff and scientists call for his resignation. But how many have been backed at a position to sack Mr Cummins? Dominic Cummins is at the centre of the national row regarded in alleged breach of coronavirus lockdown rules. In March, the Prime Minister's chief aide has been accused of driving from London to County Durham at the height of lockdown restrictions in breach of the lockdown rules. But how many believe Mr Cummins should resign and will he quit? Dominic Cummings is Boris Johnson's closest political advisor, working in the upper reaches of a government and Conservative party for almost 20 years. Mr Cummings was seen leaving down the street on March the 27th, and three days later was confirmed to be self-isolating self -isolating with coronavirus symptoms. But despite the UK being in lockdown, it is claimed Mr Cummings travelled 260 miles from London to Durham between the 27th and the 37th of March. Police in Durham were made aware of reports that an individual had travelled from London, Dominic Cummins, obviously special not, to London to Durham and was present at an address in the city of March the 31st. Officers then made contact with the owners of that address. Government draws up rescue plan for key co companies. Government draws up rescue plan for key companies. Stay alert. We can all help control the virus if we stay alert. This means you must stay at home as much as possible. Work from home if you can. 
limit contact with other people. Keep your distance if you go out, two metres, at least one metre apart where possible. Should be every time. Wash your hands regularly. Do not leave your home if you or anyone in your household has symptoms. Apply for a test if you have coronavirus symptoms. Apply for a test if you are an essential worker. Apply for tests for a care home. Book a test if you have a verification code. Go to www.gov.uk for more information. This is all completely disgusting. Dominic Cummings being stuck up for by Boris. Somebody working for the government has deliberately decided to go out without lawful excuse when they've had coronavirus symptoms and risked our country. This is disgusting, Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson. In fact, he should be fined. He's not above the law just because he is a government official. And we are going to crack down on this. Now today I will end today's daily briefing, today's conference. Today I am ending the, I will end the daily briefing now. This briefing will now be ended. News reporters Wayne Hart, NK Local News and Awareness UK3. Briefing has ended. Thank you very much.